I know that the majority of you have read the book, and I will say that you're, you're going to thoroughly enjoy our presentation today. Before we begin, I want to go over a couple things with our audience, just so you know. Um, everyone received a white survey card. We actually would va we value your feedback, and we would love for you to please turn that in after the presentation. Um, make sure if you are attending for a class or classes to list um, which classes and which instructors um, you are attending for. Um, also, um, you also received a little green performance etiquette card, and I think that we all know that it's time to join me in silencing our cell phones and electronics and putting them away. Right? Now, those of you who are in my classes know this drill, but everybody else, we're going to stay off, try to stay off your cell phones. Um, we all know how to silence them now, so we would greatly appreciate it. Um, another thing today, we will get you out of here if you have a one o'clock class, so be patient. We understand that some of you do. After the performance today, there is a merchandise table with wine to water information and merchandise that you would like to stop if you'd like to stop by. And our author will be signing um, books and other things and, and meeting with you over here. So after the presentation, um, feel free to stop by either or both of these tables. We are thrilled that you are here. And to introduce our featured speaker today is my vice president of instruction, Randy Ledford. How are y'all doing today on a Friday? It's only 70 degrees, 70, 72 degrees outside, but it feels like it's 50 degrees in here. Is everybody okay? Um, as Christina said, I'm Randy Ledford, the Vice President of Instruction here at Caldwell Community College and Technical Institute. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to our 31st annual Lorette LaPrey, though, uh, Writers' Symposium. And I just I was just told Lorette arrived today. Uh, stand up, Lorette. <clears throat> Lorette is the retired Dean of Arts and Sciences from the college and former English teacher who founded the Writer's Symposium 31 years ago. This symposium and many campus events are made possible by our CCC and TI Foundation. So we would like to thank our foundation at this time for its ongoing support. It's my honor to introduce our featured author, Doc Henley. He is North Carolina native. He is a North Carolina native, and he, he's a recent graduate when Heber, uh, from Raleigh, North Carolina, when he became interested in the severity of the world's water shortages. He learned that at least one in six people worldwide lacks access to adequate amounts of safe water and the preventable waterborne illnesses that kill 15 million children each year. Using his bartending uh, connections and people skills, his first fundraiser yielded $6,000, and that was just the beginning for Doc. He spent a year in one of the world's most dangerous hotspots, Darfur, Sudan, where he repaired, sanitized, and built wells, which he was named a top 10 CNN Hero of the Year in, in 2009. Today, he resides in Boone, North Carolina with his wife, Amber, and their two children. He is the president of Wine to Water, whose mission is to support life and dignity for all through the power of clean water. His widely acclaimed work, which you, the one that you've been reading in your classes, Wine to Water, How One Man Saved Himself While Trying to Save the World, is a testament to finding purpose in life that will leave you thirsty to do something about the global water crisis. Crisis. Actress Julie, Julia Lewis Dreyfus said it best when she wrote, Doc Henley is a hero who had the courage to meet a challenge and believe that one person can change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Doc Henley.
appreciate y'all having me today. Um, I reckon most of y'all are supposed to have read the book. I'm guessing y'all did. Uh, but for, for a few of y'all that may have just kind of flipped through the pages like, like I might have used to done, um, I'll try to give y'all a, a bit of background on, on, on my life uh, uh, so it's not so redundant for those of you guys that have read the book um, and those that you have, you might hear something new. But um, yeah, I, I grew up uh, in the Carolinas down both uh, around the Greensboro area and Raleigh area and then also down in Greenville, South Carolina. And, uh, you know, I, I would, when I was a younger individual, I never would imagine being able to have the opportunity to do any kind of work like this. Um, I was pretty down on myself quite a bit growing up. And the reason why is because I, I, um, I didn't really kind of expound on it in the book, but um, I came from a family that was pretty exceptional uh, in about every way you can imagine. And just to give you an idea, I know y'all know about my granddaddy, and I wrote about him in the book, who I'm named after. He, he played professional football for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I tried to play football. I wanted, I wanted to be just like him, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, quite make it to the level of Pittsburgh Steelers. I couldn't quite actually make it to a college level. I actually struggled just to get on the field in a high school level. Most of my, my time was riding the bench on the high school team. And, uh, and then so uh, I, I enjoyed playing basketball as well. That was another sport I liked to do. But I, I ended up watching my younger brother by, by about five years younger than me. I, I watched him uh, grow to be six foot nine. And uh, I never, never quite made it to six foot nine. So I didn't do so well in basketball. And I, I, I enjoyed playing golf as well. That was another sport I tried to compete in. And I played with my cousin growing up, and um, he went on to be on the PGA Tour. He plays, uh, he plays on the tour right now. He won the U.S. Open a few years ago. And um, yeah, I never made it to the tour or the U.S. Open or anything like that. So sports for me, I, you know, I was constantly watching all the people around me, uh, you know, my friends, my family uh, succeed in that. I, I didn't do so well. And so, so school was another area where my family did really well in. Um, my sister is, uh, she's super smart. I remember being there when she was opening in high school, her report card that had her first and I believe her only B in her whole scholastic career. And she literally like cried when she saw the B on her report card. And I also would cry if I saw a B on my report card, but they were tears of joy because I didn't really see a whole lot of those Bs. I was a straight C, D, a few other letters that are below that. I was that kind of student. Um, you know, I, I just grew up thinking I didn't have the capacity to learn. I, I, I grew up just thinking I, I wasn't like everybody else. I wasn't smart uh, like other people in my family. And, and a lot of that was just because I, I didn't, I found out later in life, I just didn't learn really well in a classroom setting. I can't just sit in a chair for hours on end and have some teacher preach at me all week. And I'm supposed to remember all that information and regurgitate it on a test on Friday. I, my, my brain doesn't work that way. Um, and so I just grew up thinking I was incapable as an athlete, thinking I was incapable as a student. Uh, a whole other level that you guys know, um, my, my daddy was a preacher man growing up. And, uh, and so another way I guess you could kind of impress my family is just being good, at, uh, just being good. And um, I didn't do so well at that one either. You know, I, the one thing I was actually decent at in my life, the one thing I excelled at was uh, if you put rules and regulations in front of me, I have this innate, unique ability to break rules in such a like uh, a unique way that's never been done before. That it was kind of shocking, I think, to my to my family. That that was the one thing I was good at was breaking rules. But the problem is with the daddy that's a preacher man that doesn't always go over so well. So I got to a point where um, I just kind of I just kind of grew up thinking there was there wasn't a place for a guy like me in, in the world. Um, I couldn't fit in anywhere around here, so I just took off as far and as fast as I could from the Carolinas. I had this just dream in my head that I would just melt away into the mountains of Montana. I had some family out there. I, I wanted to work on a horse ranch. I just wanted to be a cowboy and, and do my, I loved watching the old John Wayne, the movies, and I just wanted to, to do that and just get away from it all. And, and so I remember I got a job on a horse ranch out there and um, I was a little bit let down. It wasn't quite like, uh, like I had envisioned it in my head being. You know, I thought I'd be out riding the range all day long, rounding up cattle and doing all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, about 90% of my time, I was just shoveling horse manure all day long. And um, I didn't really make that good of money. So I just, a lot of times I just lived in the barn. 
uh, until I had enough money to find a place to live. But, you know, something really important happened to me at that time. Um, I was alone for most of, of the first year that I was out there. And I didn't have anybody around me that I had to compare myself to anymore. I didn't have any brothers, sisters, uh, you know, friends to, to, to look and see how well they're doing and how well I'm not doing. So this, I felt like it was one of the first times in my life that I noticed that there, were, there was this voice in my head that was constantly reminding me of that I'm, I'm just, I'm not like everybody else. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. And I think that voice just slowly went away after a handful of months and years. I just remember I, I didn't wake up every day just being down on myself all the time. And um, it's crazy. I, I started uh, kind of making my way back across the country, uh, back to the Carolinas. Uh, my mama was really on my case about trying to go back to school because I had dropped out of my first semester of college. And so, you know how mamas do with their boys. I, I finally gave in to her and um, I, I started going to a community college not far outside of Raleigh where uh, my folks were living there at the time and so I started going there to kind of get my grades up and I uh, did okay there and, and that allowed me to, to enroll in the North Carolina State University and I finally was able to get accepted there and, um, while I was in school paying my way through school I just kind of uh, landed a job in a restaurant I started serving people their food and that was one of my favorite jobs I remember in my life that I'd ever had, I'd worked construction, I'd worked with horses, I'd, I'd done all kind of different style of, of, of jobs, but being in a restaurant, I remember just, if I did my job right and brought out the food hot, the drinks cold, with a good smile and a good conversation, like I could actually have an, an impact on these people's day. If I, all I had to do is do my job well with a smile on my face and I'd, I'd be able to pay the bills, but at the same time, I could have a positive impact on the people that I were seeing every day. And um, I remember that had an impact on me. I really started enjoying that work. And then I got the promotion of all promotions for a guy like me, which is when they kind of moved me up to being a bartender. And um, the money was better. I was having a really good time because a lot of times you're working late nights and there's good music and a lot of fun stuff to do. And so I got to a point where I was like, I'm getting ready to graduate, but that's nothing else I want to do in my life but just be a bartender. You know, I, I, that's, that's about the epitome that life has to offer a guy like me, is what I, what I thought. Um, and something happened in December of 2003, um, as you guys know. Uh, what, what you don't know is, is before this whole idea about wine to water happened is that I'd kind of gotten to a point in my life where I, you know, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, I, I, I always have. I, I guess I have to learn the hard way on things, but sometimes when I fail or when I make mistakes, I can't just string them out over a series of weeks or months of years. When I make mistakes, I make a whole lot of them all at one time to where it feels like the whole world's like crashing around me. And uh, this was one of those times in my life, December 2003, where I was making one mistake after another after another, literally to where I needed to take a step back from everything because I may end up maybe getting myself really hurt or, um, or in jail or something like that. And so uh, um, I remember just taking a break. I, I had a Christmas, off of, uh, Christmas break off of school before my last semester of college. And, um, and I just needed to get away from work and the whole bar scene for a while. And so I took a couple weeks off the bar to come up to Boone where my parents had just moved. And um, in the middle of the night, for those of you guys that that know and read the book, I just couldn't sleep. I just remember tossing and turning in my bed and that phrase that you see on the wall back there, wine to water, it was just like stuck in my head. And I remember thinking about it, like why is it in my head over and over, like wine to water, why can I not get it out of my head? And I remember thinking, well, it, that's backwards. I, I know my daddy told me about the water to wine story and I learned about that when I was younger and it was actually one of my favorite miracles growing up because, you know, the way I, understood it is that you've got the, the the God of the universe that comes down here and he could have picked any number of miracles to do on the first one. I mean, he could have walked on water, could have raised somebody from the dead, could have fed 5,000 people, could have done, picked anyone, but the very first miracle that he chose to do was to provide wine at a wedding party that had just run out of wine. And I used to think about that, like, why would he choose that one? Why would he pick that one out of all the ones he could have done? And it, it kind of made me realize that, that maybe 
somebody as big as the God of the universe cares even about the small things in our lives. You know, that's the most important day of a young man, a young woman's life when they get married. And in and, and most cultures, if you run out of wine at a, at a big event like that, that's just not a, that's not a good thing. And um, so just to do something as simple as taking water and turning it into wine, I, I, that always was just such a cool thing to me that he would choose to care about the small things in our lives. And so why was that stuck in my head? Why was it backwards? And I didn't really know, but I couldn't sleep at this time, so I'm on my computer. As you guys know, I went down, I started researching, and that's the night I learned about the world's water crisis. Just researching about water. I had these three words on my page that I had written down. I couldn't sleep. The thing that shocked me that night the most, even more so than finding out that there were these families, these women and children that are walking literally three, four, five hours every single morning. They get up before the sun comes up and start walking to gather their water. That was just something so foreign to me, but even more so than that, learning that, that more young children in the world aren't gonna, aren't gonna make it to the age of five. They won't see their fifth birthday because of dirty water. You know, something that we take for granted every single day of our life. You know, I, I could not make sense of that, that the number one killer of children in the world is not hunger, not any other diseases like HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, or the three diseases below diarrheal disease. And diarrheal disease, which is due to the dirty water, kills more than all those, all of them combined, combined together. But I had never heard anything about that. So I remember I was able to get my friend Tasha that you guys read about, uh, we, we were able to put on the very first Wanda Water event. We had like 300 people show up and raised quite a few thousand dollars. And I'm, we're sitting there counting the money, and I'm just like thinking, gosh, I was hoping we could maybe help one family or one village, but I think we may can do a lot more now than what I had originally thought. And um, I think the most shocking thing to me, though, other than you know the fact that we raised so much money on that first night, was just that for the first time in my life, I, something that I was a part of actually worked. You know, almost everything I tried to do in my life before that moment was a failure. And so I actually kind of got used to, to failure. It's something that I became comfortable with. I had to get used to it. Um, and so we had another event like a month later. And as you guys know, I was looking for a place to put the money. I, I didn't know how to do all these wells. You know, I didn't know how to, how to do any of this stuff. I'm not sure if it's on the screen back there. You see it? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't know how to do any of this type of work. Um, so I was just like, well, I'm just going to donate the money to another charity that's already doing this, and I'll just go on back to being a bartender. I'm happy doing that. And as you guys know, I met a, a, a guy named Kenny Isaacs who ended up being a very um, um, a, a good friend of mine early on. But he also became a mentor of mine in my life, and I remember he he you know heard about what wine to water and the kind of the dream I had and what I was thinking and. And he just asked me some hard questions that first day. He's like, what are you doing right now with your life? What, what are you wanting to do with your life? And, and I, kept, I kept telling him, well, I'd love to just keep raising money and, and, and let, make sure people know about what's going on in the world with this water crisis. And he's like, well, I think it's important for you to see it for yourself. You can't just keep looking at a computer screen or watching the news and expect to actually tell people what's really happening in the world. So I, I tell you what, why don't you go back and quit your bar job and why don't you come, come work for me? Uh, he offered me a job, and as y'all know, six months later, after, this was after my very first events, six months after, so like August of 2004, I'm on a plane to, to Darfur, Sudan, um, which as you see in this picture here, I think it went over. Yeah, yeah it went. Um, that was one of the first wells we started working on. I didn't have a, a lot of money. I didn't have like hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy drilling machines and all this kind of stuff. But I did some research and I found out that over 60% of the wells in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is where the western region of Sudan was, over 60%, 6 out of 10 of the wells that had been put in by churches or, or nonprofit organizations, charities, those type of folks from around the world, well over half were sitting there broken. And I, I just couldn't understand that. And as I started driving around the desert and finding out, sure enough, these wells are all over the place just sitting there broken. And people were walking right past them for hours to get their water. And so I, I was able to get a team of guys together and we started fixing these wells and, and fixing hundreds of them all over the desert. And then it hit me, it's not something I thought of at the beginning, it actually happened unfortunately a little closer to the end of my time there in Sudan, but I started thinking, well, aren't, aren't we just doing the same thing everybody else is doing? We're just fixing these people's problems for them. 
But then one day these wells are just going to break again and, and I won't be here anymore. So I think we need to do things a little different. What if we got extra toolkits, extra materials, extra you know, supplies? And, and what if we went to these communities and, and, and brought together local people in the area and we formed like a little water committee and we taught them how to fix their own wells? We taught them how to access their own water instead of always relying on somebody from, from another country to come and save them. And so that's when I really started getting excited about this type of work that, that maybe we can do it differently and maybe we could in each area utilize local people and local materials to, to do this work. And, um, and so I actually started getting excited wanting to come back home and, and continue with Wind to Water. My, my brain over there in Sudan was constantly going because I had a lot of downtime. There wasn't a lot of power. A lot of times we're sleeping out in the desert. Um, you know, didn't have any of the technology that we've got right now. It's like 2004. So, I, you know, I, I had a lot of time just to think right next to a, a fire in the middle of the desert. And my mind was just going, thinking and dreaming about where we would go one day with Wind to Water. And, Unfortunately, when I came back home uh, in, in late 2005, I wasn't quite as excited um, to keep doing this work as you guys know that have read the book. Uh, there was quite a few things that happened there that were that were that were pretty difficult for me uh, to deal with. And uh, you know, from whether it's the, the for those of you that hadn't read it, the, the government uh, of Sudan was sponsoring the local militia there, a group called the Janjaweed which in the local language, it means the evil horsemen. Uh, they were sponsoring them to, to carry out this genocide, to kill the people in, the, in uh, the areas of Darfur, the four tribe, or to make them move into neighboring Chad. That was kind of their mandate, either kill them or make them move away. We don't want them here anymore. And uh, one of their weapons, one of the things they would do was to shoot up the wells or to break the wells or to you know, destroy the water systems. Um, and so we were uh, going around and fixing those wells. And, um, and so I, I don't know if that's, something that caused us to be a, a threat or whatever, or the areas that we chose to work, the people that we chose to help. But in the end, uh, the, the Janja, we ended up targeting us and our guys, and um, they, they had you know, destroyed our water system. And, and our first place we worked in Marla camp, dropped bombs on the, on the village and the camp, destroyed the water system, beat one of my guys almost to death. Um, they set up an ambush for us you know, a handful of months after that. And then just before I came home, you know, they did capture one of my team members, uh, one of my friends, Ismail, uh, on his way back into work from being home for a couple days, and they, you know, they executed him. So all those things put together, you know, I, when you're in the middle of all that in the field, you just kind of go through, and you don't really harp on it too much, you don't really dwell on it too much and think about it. But when I got home, like my, I remember my first day or two on the ground, even being back in in the U.S., I just I just couldn't, I couldn't function anymore. I remember I, I remember not being able to make sense of anything anymore. I tried, I, I used to think, gosh, it'd be nice just to go right back to the bar and have a cold beer and have a good conversation with my friends about, about nothing important and maybe just who's dating who and whatever. And I just remember getting back and trying even to do that and just, it didn't work anymore. I didn't even know who I was anymore after that. And, and, um, and so it was pretty tough for me, actually. And I, I have to tell y'all the culture shock that I had. A lot of people ask about that when I first went into Sudan, because I did have some pretty serious culture shock. The first two weeks I was there was something like I'd never experienced in my life. I remember being very ashamed of myself um, because you gotta understand, I mean, I'm, I'm a boy from the Carolinas, raised in a, in a pretty much conservative, white Christian home and here I am getting ready to move to a tribal black African 95% Islamic community and before I went over there I was terrified now, I wasn't so much scared of the war I don't think going on or the genocide you know I, 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 I didn't really think about that or that I might die or something like that in the war but I was I was more scared of just the unknown. I was more scared of what I didn't understand. I was more scared of all the news stuff that I saw against these Islamic communities in these in these areas, and I, I was terrified of the people or the communities of something that I just didn't know. Or I didn't understand, and I remember my first two weeks just being so ashamed of myself because um, the people that I got to do life with there, the people that ended up becoming my friends and my team members, were some of the most loving 
giving, serving people that I'd have ever met in my entire life. And so I'd experienced culture shock there, but I didn't know I was going to have to go through it all over again when I came home. And I'm telling y'all, it was the hardest few days of my life right when I came back home. All I could do when I look back at that year that I spent there, all I could do, all I could see were all my mistakes, all the things I should have done different and could have done better. And, and, um, and I was pretty defeated and, and I, w I probably would have just thrown my hands up and, and, uh, and walked away from all this and just gone right back to being a bartender had I not met my wife. Um, some of y'all know her. She actually used to work here at Caldwell Community College. She, she taught special needs uh, adults up in, uh, up in Boone at Wachaga Opportunities. And um, she's a very special woman. It takes a, um, a certain gift set to work uh, with, with folks like that and do such a good job. And, and um, I met her, I met her in a bar, of course, back up in Boone. That's always, I guess, where I feel the most comfortable. Um, but I was just in this like really dark corner of this place because I didn't want to talk to nobody. I'm being like super emo and uh, I'm, I'm just doing my own thing and the, you know, Leonard Skinner cover band's playing and I'm, I got my beer bottle there and I'm using it as a microphone, just singing into it, and be, you know, being that really weird guy in the corner. And in the, in the middle of this song, like on the other end of this place, these double doors of this bar like swing open and this light shines in from the street. <laughs> And then this whole pack of smoking hot girls like walked in the bar together, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I've been in the desert for a year, you know? So I was just like, holy moly, <laughs> this is amazing. Um, but then I remembered what every kind of bartender knows in the back of their head. We have these unspoken rules is that you never hit on a girl when they're in a pack of girls. But if you're by yourself, if you're alone, because they'll turn into a pack of wolves and they will tear you limb from limb. I've seen it a hundred times at the end of the night, a guy's trying to go talk to a girl and get a phone number and they got all her friends around her. It's, it's a disaster. It is a disaster. So I saw all those girls and I'm like, I have no chance. And I went right back to kind of singing my song and being that weird guy in the corner. And then a few minutes later, I get a tap on my shoulder. I turn around and I'm not kidding y'all. Those of y'all that know her will probably nod your head. The smokingest, hottest one in the entire group had come up to me. She stuck her hand out, smiled, this big smile. She's like, hey, my name's Amber. What's your name? And I'm like, <clears throat> All right, low, lower the voice, stick your hand out, say hello. H hello, Amber, my name's Doc. It's, it's nice to meet you. You know, I'm trying to keep it cool. And she's like, oh, Doc, so you're a doctor. I'm like, yes, no. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I'm pretty far from that. But um, everybody calls me Doc, call me Doc trying to keep it cool, short, simple. I want people to think that Doc is like this cool cowboy name or whatever, so I don't want to explain the real reason behind it. And she's like, so your parents, your mom, saw you when you were born and decided, I'm gonna name my kid Doc. That's your given name. I'm like, no ma'am, it's not, but um, just, just call me Doc. My voice is kind of creeping up, I'm getting a little nervous, and she's just sitting there like, what's your real name? Come on, let me hear it. And I'm like, for God's sakes, lady, I just met you, why are you? asking me all these questions and I'm like all right look I'm named after my granddaddy my, my hero his name's Dixon so my name's Dixon but my sister who was two years older than me at the time when I was born uh, she was having a hard time talking and she couldn't pronounce it Dixon so she called me Dick Doc okay so for an ungodly amount of time my family referred to me as Dick Doc um, some people still call me Dick Doc in my family because they know how much I love that name. Um, a few of them along the way chopped off the Dick part and left the Doc part, and that's how I got Doc. And she now is like crying, laughing at me right in front of my face, which I actually found out later. I thought it was hurting my chances, but found out her favorite thing in life to do is to make fun of me. So in the end, it, it, it ended up being a really good thing for my chances. I just had no idea, and, uh, and we hit it off pretty well after that. But I'll, I'll tell y'all, uh, the most beautiful thing about her, it's got nothing to do with what I saw on the outside. She, it's the most beautiful creature I've ever seen in my life, on the, on the inside. And she had a way about her on those days when I didn't, I didn't want to get out of bed that day. I didn't want to do this anymore. I couldn't make sense of any of this world anymore. I couldn't understand how there's people out there in this world that could take all these school children out of a little school, line them up from shortest to tallest, and then their teachers, and then put a bullet in every one of their heads just because 
they were from a different tribe. I couldn't make sense of much of anything anymore. And what's my place in all this? I wanted to just go back to being a bartender, but I knew I couldn't do that anymore. But I didn't feel like I could do this work either. I'm not cut out for this kind of stuff. And she helped me find confidence and faith when I didn't have it anymore. And because of that, we were able to continue to grow. Um, from the, the first couple pictures that you saw where we were focusing on working on wells, after a while I realized it's not just wells that need to happen around the world. There's these other countries that where people live right along water sources, whether it's a river or or stream or lake or rainwater or whatever, but the water is just filthy. A lot of what's killing these kids isn't that they're walking to get water, it's that the, wa the water they're actually drinking is absolutely filthy. And so uh, we began working with water filtration techniques. Uh, those things you see there are biosin filters. We uh, work with those in northern Uganda for, for quite a while. Um, we were able to put thousands of those uh, all over uh, northern Uganda, and you can put one into a school or an orphanage and, and give up to 100 people clean water on one of those filters. Uh, and they're under $100 to make one to teach the people how to use them. So for like less than a dollar per child, you're gonna get clean water for 10 years in a school. Less than a dollar per person. And that was something I could grab hold of because again, our organization, as we began to grow finally, we, we weren't this ever multi-million dollar group. We were a small group of folks, just a bunch of, a bunch of our people that got together and tried to, to do something. But we were able to actually have a huge impact in our lives um, without much money because the big thing we did, as you see in the picture there, we used local people and local materials to do this work. From there, we began to work with a, a different type of filter that um, you'll see. There's an example of it right here. You can come take a look at it later. But um, that's me, and I think the picture showed up. Yeah, it's there. Um, the big, that's me and my oldest son and, and our team there in Dominican working on building a ceramic water filter just made out of local clay sources. That one's in Dominican. I met with those folks after the Haiti earthquake hit. We began working with these ceramic filters uh, inside Haiti and then uh, all over both Dominican and Haiti. And um, again, this is, this is a filter that costs less than $50 to make the filter, to transport it, to get it to the people that need it, to teach and train them on how to use it, and then to continually follow up to make sure that filter's okay. That's $50. For five years, these things last. So we're able to do that kind of work, and it's so much fun. You guys can actually come and volunteer with us. Um, it's so much fun to see these people when they receive these filters, how they just cherish them, because they know they don't. They know why they have to bury their children. It's not that for a parent to sit and watch their child have uncontrollable diarrhea and get to where they get so weak after a day, two days, three days, and and they don't make it anymore. They know it's something with their water. So to give them something that can change that, can change their lives, their family, their children is, is unbelievable. So that's something that if you guys are interested, you can talk to me afterwards. We have volunteer programs in Dominican and Nepal, the Amazon jungle, uh, and, and soon to be a, here in East Africa and Tanzania where you can come and work with our teams and get your hands dirty. Um, but from there, I'm still working with ceramics, biosin filters, like the ones before, the wells, local people, local materials, that was the big thing. And then I learned about what was going on in Syria, the crisis there, the war that was breaking out, and all these families, these women and kids and, and, and folks that are fleeing their homes that have just been bombarded and destroyed throughout Syria. And after a while, they shut the border of Turkey. They wouldn't allow them to go over. And so I found out, um, got word, there was like 1,500 families in these different camps right along the border that weren't being allowed in Turkey. And I hadn't really worked in any Islamic areas since Sudan. Um, it's kind of a long story, but after a while, that, uh, being in Sudan, they, it, was, it wasn't okay for me to go back uh, to Darfur. And, uh, and so I was still looking for an opportunity to, to be able to work in a, in a uh, Muslim area or culture and then this happened and I'm wanting to do what I could to help out and uh, I started searching for a different technology I couldn't pack thousands of these on a plane and fly them over there and then try to sneak them across the border somehow or the other filters that you saw they're even bigger than these and, and made of concrete like I can't get those over there so I found out there's some filters you guys may have heard of that a lot of backpackers and hikers use a company called Sawyer makes these little filters that are you know a little bit smaller than the size of like a coke can and um, they can filter water for up to 10 years and they filter water beyond our EPA standards uh, like 99.9999% clean water um, and, 
and they're unbelievable. So I, I actually was able to go meet the CEO of the company who founded it and, uh, and talk with him. And, and I'm like, I can't afford the price of what you guys sell them for in the sports stores, but would you do something and work with us as a charity and, and give us a discount if we want to bring some to these people in Syria? And he's like, absolutely. We'll send them to you. They'll be all broken down in pieces. Uh, you'll basically get them at, at our cost that we, we pay for them. Um, and you'll just have to figure out how to, how to get them there and put them together when you get there. So um, now I just needed to raise the money and there was a group, actually I got to, to talk to like this, that uh, just wanted to hear the story of Wine to Water, this company, and, and they um, asked what they could do to help. And I just told them at the end of my talk, I'm like, well, we need 1,500 water filters. I'm trying to figure out how to pay for those to get them inside Syria. And it was amazing. My wife and I were there that day and after my talk, I was having coffee and they all started talking and chattering. And, Next thing I know, like an hour later, they come up to my wife and I with a big manila envelope and they had gone around and gathered cash from everybody in the room and they raised enough money. We needed like, it ended up being, we needed about $50 a filter for the filter, the cost of transport, and then the, the team to get them in. And so they ended up gathering all that for 1,500 filters. It was like $75,000, all that in one day. And so I was like, all right, sweet. I guess I'm heading to Syria here in a couple of days. So I packed the, uh, these duffel bags full of the filters after we ordered them, took off into Turkey. We were able to meet with some of the rebel leaders um, and the Free Syria Army who controlled the north of Syria. Uh, so they were able to kind of help sneak us in across the border. Um, and we were able to distribute the water filters to the people that, that needed them there. And, um, and then I was able to, to get back across. and. Um, and from there, we began to use those filters for other things too. There's other, oh, this is uh, where we went across the border. Um, that was the, the actual border. You can kind of see the barbed wire behind there. And there were all these kids in this camp that kind of greeted us. Uh, and we worked with a, uh, a local uh, Islamic charity there. And you can see the name of them on, you can see our wine to water sticker on one bucket. And the name of that charity is called Zakat, which in, in Arabic means that's their word for, for charity, for like charity or for giving. Um, we worked with them to team up uh, so that we can have people to translate and uh, make sure that people use the filters properly. But from there, we were able to get these filters all over. I mean, I, there was the super typhoon that hit the Philippines not long after that. And um, this is a picture I took on my phone uh, right after I landed. It, uh, there was a, a C-130 that, uh, that landed me in the local airport there so that we could start bringing filters. And we were able to start bringing these filters to some of the worst disasters that, you know, that the world has seen. And we're able to also use them way up in the Amazon jungle in these old dugout canoes, uh, because they're not even, this isn't a very big filter, but if you want to bring 200 of these into a small village in the Amazon jungle, it takes up a lot of space. So we're able to get these smaller filters up on the canoes. And, um, and I want to leave you with, because I know I want to open it for some Q&A here in just a minute. Um, I want to leave you with one last picture. Let's see if I can find, let's see if I can see it. There we go. Um, this is a picture that, that we took uh, right there inside Syria that first day that we got there. And I didn't, again, it's kind of like Sudan when I first went out. I didn't really know what to expect because there's a war going on. There's a lot of bad things happening. I, saw, I know what I saw on the news and a lot of kids getting hurt and like blood on their faces and dirt and they're going to these hospitals. And so I, I wasn't really knowing what, was, what I was going to see. And um, it's crazy. I want to leave with this picture here because, you know, I've seen some of the worst disasters I think the world has, has had in this last generation. You know, I've been to Haiti after the earthquake. I've been to the Philippines after that super typhoon. I've been inside Syria. I've been to Darfur. And almost every time, 99% of what I see is what you see on the screen back there. It's not what the world tells you. It's not what you'll see on the news. I think the world does a really good job of lying to us. You know, kind of like that voice that was in my head most of my life telling me I, I wasn't any good, I wasn't worth anything, I wasn't ever gonna amount to anything in my life. Just that constant lies. I feel like I see those every single day when I turn on the news. That the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But every time I go to one of these spots that you would expect to be falling apart, you would expect to see these kids with their bellies popping out and flies all over their face and just super sad, you don't see that anywhere. This is what you see. And so I want to encourage you guys as you're heading out the rest of your weekend here and then the rest of the semester and the rest of whatever 
y'all got going on in life after this that don't believe that that lie that I know probably a lot of y'all have in your heads too. I'm the kind of person that, as y'all probably know from reading and from earlier what I was saying, like I, I, if I look in the mirror at myself or I look back at my life, I have a hard, really hard time seeing any of the things that I do well. I'm the kind of person where I'm kind of my worst enemy. I, I only see the, the mistakes that I've made and the things I've done wrong. But that's not, I know that's not really who I am. And sometimes I need people like my wife, I need the team that we've got at Wine and Water to remind me of those things a lot of times. And so I wanna encourage you guys as you're going through this next weeks, months, years in your life, don't listen to that lie. That's telling you every day the things it's telling you. I wanna encourage you guys that today, I hope you see that each one of you out there is so unique and specific and made just the way you are for a reason. And I believe each one of us, were, we were created, we were made specifically for the job to love and to serve each other. So that in the end, what you see on the screen back there, that that's, that's the outcome. I think when we're on our last breath of life and we're looking back over it, we won't look back at all the drama and all the issues and all the this and that and what car you had when and what phone you had at what time. I think we'll remember the times that we had an opportunity to love somebody else, an opportunity that somebody else loved us back. I think that's what life's all about, the chance to love and serve each other and not just the people that talk like us, not just the people that pray like us or maybe not pray at all, especially the people that are different than us. To me, I think that's why we're here on this earth, to seek people out that aren't like us and to serve and love them with everything we got, all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And y'all, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be down here today. It's cool to be, be this close to home. So thank y'all for having me. I think we got time. Yeah. yeah, so we got some time for Q and A. If you guys got any questions about about the book, go ahead. I got more about the flood. Uh, last year, CCI went to the Dominican Republic with wine and water to make those filters, and uh, we're going to do that again next year. So you guys uh, check out the posters. They're going to be, you know, soon as far as when we get all the details. So keep an eye on that, so that you can come to and you know help. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Where are we at? Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. Do your time in cartoon during the Christian counselor. You said you're on top of the building watching the sunsets. How does that feel? What's that experience? Yeah. Watch the sunsets. Watch the sunsets. Project. So you said you had your Christian counseling in cartoon. They're on top of a building. You watch the sunsets. What was that experience like? How did you feel? Oh, okay. So going to the, the Christian counselor in Kenya after the shooting, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, what was that experience like? Um, that, was, that was tough for me. Um, so I, for those of y'all that know, like, after the ambush, I went out uh, for a couple weeks. They gave me some time off to kind of process everything. And I went and they, they had kind of booked up a, um, a Christian counselor for me to go talk to. And that, that was really, it was a hard thing for me because I felt like... Um, even though I know the person meant well and they're wanting to, to talk me through the problem and all that, it was kind of like the very typical, uh, you know, you sit down in a chair and there's all these leather bound books around you and this is like library and he's sitting there and he's like, so how did that experience make you feel? I'm like, shit, I don't know, man. I don't know how it made me feel like, <laughs> not good. <laughs> like, I, and, and so I started realizing like, as he asked me all these questions, like he, I think he has you know, a great heart and really wants to help me, but also, it's his job, that's what he's there to do every day. Not taking it away from him that he's also passionate about his job and really wanting me to heal, but it, it was a really hard thing for me to wrestle with that whole thing, um, the idea of seeing a counselor. And so I had to struggle through that for years and years and years actually. So not just situations like that, but when I would go back to the field, whether it's Haiti earthquake or then come back, like I, I didn't really know how to handle it. I probably should have continued to try to go see a counselor or, or something to, to walk through those things, but unfortunately for like four or five years, I did a terrible job of managing 
those emotions and, and things that would happen when you go to a developing world and you come back to the first world and back and forth. And it honestly didn't really start to make sense to me of how to compartmentalize the two different things, whether you see a disaster or whether you see, I mean, some of the things that I saw in some of these places, like how to take it and then when you come home, how to put it somewhere else. And I'll tell you, that though, it wasn't a counselor, it wasn't sitting down and talking with folks, it wasn't, you know, talking about my feelings with, with my wife, which is, uh, she's great about that, but, but uh, she's like, look, I can't understand what you've seen. So I, I, I'd love to be here to listen, but I don't know how to help you. I remember, though, when it all started to switch for me was after Haiti earthquake, this one trip I had gone on, I, that everybody's in a fog because they just literally lost how, hundreds of thousands of lives. And there, I saw people like just dead on the side of the road or somebody just got hit by a car and they just keep driving. And there was this one old man that uh, he was with his grandson and his, he just got smashed by a car and his legs all busted up and his bones sticking out of his out of his pants. He's bleeding everywhere and his grandson's trying to find somebody to help him. And everybody's like zombies just walking by because they're still in shock from the earthquake. And I had a group of, uh, there's some other uh, Americans there with me who were just gotten there. So they were a little shocked too. And they were just staring at the guy. Everybody's just looking at him, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, went down, and I just grabbed the guy up, and like waved down a car, put him in the car, and we took him to the hospital. And so we got the guy squared away, and that was not long before I just had to come home, got him, you know, taken care of at the hospital. And I remember coming back home, and I'm still processing like all these things that, I, you know, that I've been seeing. And my wife comes to me like right at the door, and I'm expecting like a big old hug, like, welcome home. And she's like, we had like baby number two at this time and her hair's like out here. And she comes to me with a baby like just in diapers and she's like, he has a poopy diaper? You're gonna change it? I'm going to get my nails done. I don't wanna see you again for the rest of the day. I'm like, I just got home, <laughs> you know? So she hands me a screaming baby with a poopy diaper and she takes off and I'm looking at this little creature with a stinky diaper. And I'm going in the, in the room and I'm like, I'm like, I got a choice here. I can either sit and moan and complain in my head about all that's wrong with the world and all that needs to be fixed, or I could just right now figure out how to turn it off and, and figure out how to enjoy just being a dad right now and, and figure out how to change the sticky diaper <laughs> on my own without my wife here. And, um, and I remember that was just a switch for me and I don't know why or how it happened, but after that moment, like when I'm back home, I don't always do the best job of it, but I had to figure out how to turn off all that stuff and just be present with my kids, with my wife, with whatever we got going on. So I know I just answered probably a really simple question with like a 10 minute, you know, soliloquy, but sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you ever figure out what the mystery monster at the Haunted Lake was, or is it just assumed that that's a problem? <laughs> that's a great question. Did we ever figure out what the mystery monster in the, in the lake was? I have no idea, because I hightailed it out of there so fast, right after I kind of got that feeling when I got the water on my face. But you know, like, like I, found out later in that hut when I, when the guy was trying to explain with his hands like what the you know what's in there my only guess is that it was just some because the area not long before that was in even parts of it still were very like rainforest like and i met a guy that had like apparently killed the last lion in the area so there were all these wildlife still in the area in the you know in, in that mountainous volcanic region so my only guess it was just some monster croc and the people would allow their livestock to go in the mountain of the volcano because there was a lot of really nice grass there. And my guess is that the crop continue to just stay surviving off of livestock, sheep and goats and things like that. So that's my only, my only guess. There was a story of a, uh, another aid worker that had, that had gone swimming uh, there like years before this story this had gone around. And that, that it must have been another really crazy person like myself that that was told about this monster or whatever and, and so this is the, the story i have no idea if it's true or not but the story was that 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 his guys that they were with that traveled up there made him tie a rope around him um just just in case so they can pull him back or whatever and he's like yeah whatever tie a rope around me i'm, I'm gonna be fine i'm gonna swim and a, apparently the story is that he jumped in and that something sucked him down and that the rope just went with him and that was the story so that of course made me be like oh dude i've got to swim in that thing right now <laughs> so no but right i'm telling you right when i hit my face with the water everything inside of me was just like it was like get on your horse and ride away like right now so 
I listened for once to that one. So yeah, go ahead. Um, have you heard from Mustafa? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Yes, if I heard from Mustafa. I haven't, and so um, I've wanted to go back to Darfur. Uh, I've, I, I'll, I can explain later when I have more time, but there was a few reasons why I can't, I can't go back there now. Uh, maybe now it's, it's far enough, I'm not sure, but uh, not long after my time there, it was, there was rumors going around. We think that the government was maybe spreading rumors with the Janjawi that there was somebody in the area where I was working that was like training the local rebels on how to fight like they were like an undercover CIA agent that was doing water work. And so, I mean, I was flattered if that was the case, like if they were thinking that I was the guy doing that, because that would mean I'd be like Jason Bourne or something like that. Um, but, uh, but, but long story short, they, um, that was the rumor going around. And so my guys that had gone back there were like, dude, you can't come back here. Because that one of my buddies, Coley, who's back there, we look a lot alike. They pulled him in to the um, like their version of the NSA, their national security guys, pulled him in, they contained him, and like asked him all these questions. And they're thinking maybe he was me that went back and got a different passport. They were asking all these questions, how he knows me, and all this stuff. And so he's like, dude, you can't come back here. So it's been a while. But now I've got some guys that are in the south of Sudan, and we've talked about um, doing some work there with them, but then sneaking into Darfur from the south, and uh, trying, because I really would like to know if he's still, if he's still around. He's, he'd be a lot older now, actually. He'd probably be in his mid-20s if he's still alive, but I have, I have no idea. Kid. So I, I hope so, it'd be good. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, any other questions? We good? Take one more. One more? So, um, what type of uh, defenses did you take uh, whenever you went over there? Because I hear that there's a lot of like hygienic issues and such. Like, how did you prevent yourself from getting sick from the diseases? Like, uh, like medical, like for like malaria and other things like that. Yeah. So, what what type of things did I do to defend against other diseases and things like that? I didn't do a good job of it actually. So, <laughs> I hate taking medicine, any medicine. I mean, I hate like literally. I was in a motorcycle crash like like a little over two years ago, right on the Haiti Dominican border and I shattered my pelvis and my, my hand was all the way down to the bone. And so the lady was having to clean it and she was getting ready to give me a shot of morphine or something. I don't know what it was. And she, I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you getting ready to shoot me up with? And she, they're in, they're in Spanish, you know, so I'm trying to converse back in my broken Spanish and I'm like, no, no, you put that down, you know? And I wouldn't even let her give me any, you know, ibuprofen or anything like that. Cause one, I hate like, I don't, I, I'm okay if I have a few beers or whatever, but if I can't control what's in here, it freaks me out. If I can't control my thoughts and my brain, so I hate all, any kind of medicines or whatever. So I'm having to walk her through like how to stitch up my hand because she's wanting to just like, you know, stitch it up with all that gnarly black road grime still on it. So I had to have her cut, you know, the skin and all that kind of stuff. My wife thinks I'm insane. She's like, why didn't you just take the medicine? Because it didn't feel very good. But that being said, I, I don't I have this like, I, I don't know what it is about medicines or whatever, I just hate them. So I don't, I started taking malaria meds when I got there like my first week and I just, I didn't like it anymore. So I quit taking all that stuff. Um, I'm, I was supposed to keep up on my typhoid stuff, you know, every year or two and I've quit doing that. So I've gotten malaria. Uh, it was awful. Don't get malaria, it's not fun. Um, I, I actually got it when I came back home. It's when it started hitting me. But I always bring, they have a cure there that you can get that you can take in three days and it gets rid of it. It's not approved by the FDA here because nobody gets malaria, so they don't need to approve new medicines for it. But I always was bringing it home just in case. And that day when I came down with malaria, it was, um, it was not a good day or a few days. But um, so that was bad. I got, I've gotten typhi or a, a strand of typhoid when I was in Ethiopia. That was awful. I've had amoeba, dysentery. You know, basically, if y'all, y'all, any of y'all know that old ass game, the Oregon Trail? Y'all know what that is? If you haven't played it, you need to play it. It's like a green screen computer game. You should go on there and play it. Basically, all the things that this guy's wife keeps dying from is the stuff that I would always get. Like, your wife has just died from typhoid. Like, oh great, that's awesome. So, I kept getting all the stuff that all these old travelers would always die from. And anyway, um, yeah, so. I didn't do very good at that. If y'all want to come with us to the field, definitely do it. But they, we have like this, these things that you're supposed to take, like or, or the shots you're supposed to get. Do it. Like do those things. It's, <laughs> none of that stuff's any fun. I think we're good. I think we are. Yeah. Our author will sign over here if you'd like to have a selfie with him, a picture book sign, and also. We
like to invite you to a reception in the library afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, y'all.